Hi and welcome back to our CLPE podcast. So the last two weeks have been really exciting at CLPE. Um, obviously we unveiled our 180 foot King's Cross hoarding with Oliver Jeffers and King's Cross Academy, which is really quite epic. If you want to go down and have a look, it's, it should be there into the new year. Um, great selfie walls and some really, really lovely anecdotes from some of the children at King's Cross Academy as well. Um, and some, some illustrations from the likes of people like Ken, Ken Wilson Max. So we've got um, poetry from Connie Huck. So definitely, definitely recommend you go down and see that at Lewis Cubitt Square in King's Cross. Um, obviously, we've also had our online course announcement, which has been going really well. Um, everyone's received that really well. We've got a few bookings already. So really looking forward to getting that started. And it just means that you still have the access to a high quality learning from home, um, obviously under the current restrictions. Uh, it's a bit hard for us at the moment to deliver that to you in person and we still want to be able to reach you guys so that's all set up now and ready to book if you want to have a look at our course program online the teaching team have been working really hard on that um, and also we've got new take five for our power of reading members as well so if anyone is having to send their bubbles home or things like that we know a lot of that's going on in schools at the moment um, so it just gives you the opportunity to still create that um, that high quality work at home in the home environment for anyone that's having to isolate um, and of course our annual clipper which we're focusing on today of course um, and again I'm joined by Charlotte who had the privilege of judging this year's awards along with um, poet Valerie Bloom we had uh, last year's winner Steve Camden and Tra uh, Tracy Greary from the Children's Poetry Archive as well um, so they did a great job judging the shortlist and today we're going to be joined by Zara Will who was the Clipper 2020 winner for her collection Cherry Moon and obviously um, you had a highly commended as well this year for um, Poems the Wind Blew In which is by Carmelo C. Irabaran and so we're joined by Lawrence Schimmel who's the translator from the collection as well so it'd be great to talk to them shortly. Um, so this year's award, I mean, it was very different to the previous years that we've had. Um, obviously the Clipper Prize is usually awarded at a celebratory poetry show at the National Theatre. And we usually have about a thousand school children and invited guests that come down to watch all the great performances from the poets and the winners of the shadowing scheme. So this year we're doing it slightly differently. We will talk about a little bit about the shadowing scheme a little later on as well. Um, so due to the pandemic, obviously we couldn't host it this year at the National Theatre, unfortunately. But our friends at The Times and Sunday Times Cheltenham Literature Festival stepped in to support us and actually hosted the award ceremony with us on their virtual platform for Cheltenham Festivals, which actually went really well. There was a lot of planning involved in that. So a big thank you to them. Um, we still had some incredible performances from the shortlisted poets, which are on our YouTube as well, if you want to catch some of those um, videos as well of the poets reading their poetry from the shortlist. Um, and actually, it turned out that we ended up reaching an audience of over four times the amount that we usually would of about 4000 children, which is absolutely great. So it did it did have its ups um, and it did actually go really well. So thank you to everyone involved in that. If uh, if you did miss the live stream on the 9th, you can actually still watch it on Cheltenham Festival's website. Um, they've got something called The Den where you can watch back. Um, so I definitely recommend you watch it. We've had some really great feedback of how it went. It was, it was actually quite a good show, wasn't it? It was a really spectacular kind of show. Um, so we also, like I said, we've got some footage on our YouTube as well. So make sure you hit the subscribe on our YouTube. And we'll also be able to tell you where you can find the teaching notes for all the shortlisted books on our website as well. Um, so as I said, it's not too late to join the Shadow in this game. So we'll give you the information for that later on because it's working a little bit differently this year. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to start first of all by talking about the important, uh, importance of poetry within schools and education. Um, and so Charlotte, there's been a lot of discussion around this lately and how often it can kind of be undervalued. So I just kind of wanted to get your, your take on that. Yeah, uh, poetry is often seen as not as 
important in the curriculum as things like narrative fiction, as things like picture books. It's a real shame. Um, we did a big piece of research back in 2017, 2018, The Power of Poetry, um, which was a real deep dive look into how poetry is perceived and how it's being taught in the primary classroom. And what we found out from that is it's not because of teachers' willingness to do poetry in the classroom, it's because it's not such a focus on the end of key stage assessments. And teachers find it really hard Hard to see where poetry fits into the bigger picture of reading and writing by those assessment standards. Mm -hmm. Everybody on the course valued poetry, they all wanted to do poetry, but it was that constraints of the curriculum into fitting it in with those assessment measures that really came out. So one of the things I wanted to talk about today was how poetry is so important and so vital to building children as readers and writers. And that comes right from the beginning with our very youngest children moving into those stages of early literacy. We know from a lot of research that children who develop a really solid foundation in song, rhythm and rhyme do better as readers and as writers. Um, collections like our 2016 uh, joint winner, A Great Big Cuddle by Michael Rosen and Chris Riddell, are perfect for this. It helps children to know the rhythms, the patterns of language. They can look at poems on the page like this and begin to chime in with the reading, but also make those connections that the words on the page carry meaning, they say something. Um, also a beautiful collection for those early readers is James Carter's Zim Zam Zoom, which was shortlisted in 2017. This one's a brilliant one for connecting it with children's understanding um, of phonics as well, and that they can begin to lift words on the page knowing uh, the phonic knowledge that they know from their phonic sessions in school. So you've got things in here like crack and bam and boom. Children can do their segmenting and blending and begin to actually know that they are readers themselves and they can lift words off the page. What's also important through poems um, in collections like this is for children to know that they can express themselves through writing as well. There are some lovely poems in Michael Rosen's Great Big Cuddle that really connect children with their feelings. Um, there's a fantastic one in here called I Am Angry, which is just about expressing the feelings of being angry. So through studying poems like that, children know that writing is a form of communication for them and it can help them to express their own ideas, describe their own experiences, but also to enter to know that poetry is enjoyable and it's fun to give that intrinsic value of enjoyment of reading and writing as well. Now, as readers and writers develop, that continued importance of rhyme is still really important in terms of developing children's knowledge of phonics and spelling. Um, but also, performing, listening to, reading poetry is really good for children developing that reading fluency. They really understand the value of the words on the page. To perform it well, they have to read and reread. They have to take note of the punctuation on the page. And that really helps them with developing reading fluency. Two collections I particularly want to mention for um, developing readers is our 2015 winner, Werewolf Club Rules by Joseph Coelho, and Moon Juice, our 2017 winner, um, by Kate Wakeling. There are some brilliant poems in here that really do tune children in to how words look on the page, which is important for your early readers, but also important for your readers who are reading at greater depth to really tune in to how words are spelt and what they look like and the different patterns between words as well. There's a fantastic poem uh, in this collection called Telescope, which really focuses the reader um, this one here, Moon Juice, which really focuses the reader on different words that have the letter O in them, but the O can sound different in all kinds of different words. And so it really develops that interest in spelling. And we know that children who are our better readers are, again, those children who are better spellers and writers as well. Um, what's great about these two collections as well is that they also have a real depth of poetry. They've got funny poems that are going to engage the readers to entertain them, to make them laugh. But they've got some really deep and reflective poems which help children develop that comprehension beyond the literal. That's what we want in our developing readers. But also those poems that really are written well and crafted well so that children know how to use language really effectively to engage a reader themselves when they're doing their own writing. And again, those poems, like in the early stages, that show children that writing can be used to entertain, but it can help you capture a specific snapshot of a moment in time, but it can also help you reflect on or express your emotions.
Now, as we move into that high impact goal where we're looking for at key stage two is our children who are really working at greater depth. And poetry is also fantastic for supporting them as well. Poetry really helps to hone children in on spelling, punctuation and grammar. The brevity of poetry is fantastic for this. Poets really choose the right words, the right punctuation for absolute effect to make absolute impact on their readers. So studying a poem in this way is a really good way of really looking at how grammar works for effect in absolute practice and how writers by the end of year five and six can make pragmatic choices in their writing to really think about what they want to say to their reader and how they're going to capture that in the best way. Um, collections like The Rainmaker Dance by John Agard um, and Dark Sky Park by Philip Gross, both shortlisted of the clipper, are brilliant for this as well. Um, it helps children to develop that real knowledge of vocabulary and grammar, but with concepts outside their direct experience. One of the winning Shadowing Schools performances last year um, was of a poem called Aleppo Cat in here, which was reflecting on um, what's happening in Syria at the minute and what it's like stepping outside of their own experience and stepping into someone else's shoes and really developing those high level skills of inference, deduction and empathy through getting a really personal connection with a text. This one is also fantastic for showing children that they too can have a voice in writing. There's some poems here that actually express quite definite opinions and we want to move those higher order writers into knowing that they can do that for themselves. What we want by the end of year six is that writers are really developing that craft of writing for themselves, knowing what they want to say, but also how they want to say it and how to use language, punctuation, grammar for effect on a reader for whatever purpose they want to write for. So instead of being the poor relation, poetry should be the spine and poetry should be the pinnacle for which we can do so much literacy teaching through. Yeah, I, that was really like interesting listening to you there actually because it was taking me back to when I was younger at school and I think definitely for me poetry um, has just been one of those things that I've always connected with on on a different level I think and I just think even like reading with my my little one as well like I think it does just that like the rhythm and the rhyme and the phonetics and stuff it all comes into play with poetry so much more. Um, and I think it's a really great base for, for everything else, like you say. Um, and I think so, one of the things is, is not being scared of it as well. One of the things yeah. that really came out of the research that we did with the Power of Poetry project was that a lot of the teachers on the program had been put off by their own school experience. So it was, it was really for them in secondary school where poetry moved from actually enjoying it and embracing it to that analysis yeah. of knowing, yep, circle the personification or mm -hmm. the method but actually we need to come back to that real what is poetry what does it do for us that is unique to that genre that no other genre can do and it's about knowing what the fundamental experiences are for teaching poetry it's about listening to it listening to teachers reading it aloud but also listening to poets perform their poetry and that's where the resources on our poetry line website come into their own we've got over 250 videos there of poets performing their own poetry but then it's also about children being able to give that initial response and that's not about where's the punctuation where's the alliteration where's the yeah. metaphor that's about what does it make me think about how does it make me feel why has this been written? What does it say to us? And then it's about performing poetry as well. Children can get really under the surface of what a poem means by actually engaging in the language practically themselves and performing it so that then they can come back and have that deeper response of, yeah. well, why did I feel that way? Was it because of that metaphor or was it because of the personification the poet used? Then you can get into looking at those poetic forms and devices a little bit more before you then go, right, how do I do this myself as a writer? and move children into the writing of poetry and that's how our teaching sequences on poetry line for all of the shortlisted collections work um, they're a really good journey through engaging with poetry first at an initial level then at a deeper level through experiences like art music drama as well as reading and writing and then into launching children into write, being writers of poetry and a lot of the work that we get through actually from the schools when they, they tweet us on social media and stuff, um, a lot of it around poetry, it, you, can, you can see the level of kind of expression that children use in it Absolutely. and it's actually really lovely. 
Yeah, um, and that's that's what works on that reading fluency. Yeah. They understand the meaning behind words, so they understand what intonation they should use, where they mm -hmm. should take pause for effect, and where that reading should flow. So before we welcome our guests, this year's Clipper winner Zara Will for her book Cherry Moon, and Lawrence Schimmel, who's translated our highly commended poems The Wind Blew In, which was written by Carmelo C. Iribarren originally in Spanish. Um, I just wanted to talk to you, Charlotte, about this year's shortlist and why each of the books secured a place on the list. Absolutely. It was actually a really harmonious judging meeting this year. Um, all of us as judges were, were really, really strongly connected to the five books that we shortlisted. Um, there wasn't any of the normal tussling of uh, what deserved to go on and what didn't. We all came to a very quite quick and harmonious decision about what should be shortlisted. Um, the first one, The Proper Way to Meet a Hedgehog, this is just such a beautifully produced anthology. Walker Books have done a really good job on the production values on this. I do really, love the illustration on that, yeah. that book. Yeah. really carefully selected anthology by Paul B. Ginesco and a really good choice of illustrator in Richard Jones who gets right beneath the surface um, of the poems inside. This is again a, a book that you just want to put into a child's hands. It's got a really conversational tone to the poems so that it's almost like um, they're speaking to you as the reader um, and again they're, they're on poems that children can really connect with and enjoy. Um, Paul's done a great job of selecting poems for the anthology as well there's some older poems some more modern poems uh, there's poems that play with language on the page there's poems that connect children with nature there's poems that make children want to join in. Like, I mean, I think one of the ones that's probably going to come through um, on the Shadowing School entries is Mix a Pancake. It's a real poem that you actually just want to get up and perform. Every page is so carefully crafted and so carefully put together. Um, beautiful, quiet illustrations like this one. And then some very active illustrations um, as well beautiful use of colour and space. Again, Richard Jones has done a really, really brilliant job. And there's lots of different forms of poetry in here. So every child is going to find something uh, in there for them. Uh, next was our highly commended collection, Poems the Wind Blew In. Um, this again was uh, a one that you wanted to give to people, but just in a completely different way. You wanted everyone to have a copy of this in their pocket as they walked around and interacted with the world. Um, I think what struck the judges was the real complex simplicity in this collection. It's a really well crafted book of poetry and you've got to give credit not just to the poet Carmelo Sierra Baron for this but also the translation work of Lawrence Schimmel. Um, that translation is a really really highly revered job that it's quite difficult to retain the original poetry whilst translating into English and Lawrence has done a fantastic job with this as well. Um, there are there is beautifully beautiful beautiful imagery created in this not just through the illustrations that Rhea Chowdhury's done um, but in the poems that uh, Carmelo and, and Lawrence have crafted. This one in some places the ship cuts the sea the sea bleeds white foam complicit the moon watches it's a really great one for older children to really think about what you can do with language to paint a picture and just how poetry is everywhere in the world around you it's like you could just sit for five minutes in the street in the park anywhere and poetry can come out of you and mm -hmm. I think that's why that's a really important collection for children as well um, we've then got our YA title, Wayne, uh, by Rachel Plummer and illustrated by Helene Bopin. Um, again, stunningly produced collection. Um, the thought that's gone into the production values of this is just beautiful. The illustrations are just a magical, not just a conversation with the poems, but an extension into a whole new story world. Um, what struck the judges about this one was that it all drew us in to some really rich Scottish folklore, but seen through completely new eyes, which gave it fresh life for a new uh, generation of readers. We all wanted to find out more about the folklore behind it at the end of it. Um, again, beautifully crafted poetry, expert use of language and real challenge for readers at Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4 to think about why Rachel put this po poetry collection together and how the threads of that weave in every single poem that she's written. 
Uh, our second anthology was Midnight Feasts by A.F. Harold and illustrated beautifully by Katie Riddell. Um, this again was, was held up as a really expert example of how to curate a poetry anthology. Um, the work that A.F. Harold has done in really taking the reader on a journey, um, not just through food, but through food in different places with different people, um, the poets that he has selected to be part of this anthology are a veritable who's who of absolute brilliant poetry talent. Um, everyone from the one of the poets who got me into poetry when I was a very young child, Brian Patton, one of the original Mersey poets, um, to people like Imtiaz Darker and Sabrina Mafuz. There's a brilliant um, long poem in there, Zara's Super Pomegranate Supper Show by Sabrina Mafuz. Um, and uh, favourites from uh, Clipper Past as well, Halloween's Crumble by Joseph Quelo. Uh, there are such a rich variety of forms in here. There are funny poems. There are poems that are going to make you cry. There are poets that are going to make you think. Um, I have, having worked with uh, Ashley before, both as a Clipper uh, Chair of Judges and on our poetry course, I know how much uh, he knows about poetry and it absolutely shines out of this book. Um, not to use a corny pun, but it is an absolutely delicious collection of poetry um, and one that should be in every key stage two classroom. And then we have our winner, Cherry Moon, um, by Zaro Weil and illustrated by Jun Lee Song. We picked this uh, up because it is a delightful collection that is just so perfect for now. It exudes the absolute awe and wonder of being a child and exploring the world and engaging with the world and reflecting on the world around us. It's, um, there are funny poems in here again, but there, it's a quiet and thoughtful collection which really engages the reader in understanding how to express moments of joy and wonder through poetry. Um, again, the production values on this one were really highly commented on. It's a beautifully produced book that you want to gift to people. It's just the right size. It's, um, it's, it's funny because we talked about these two together for quite a long time while we were selecting uh, who would win. And they, they do the same thing in completely different ways. This is one that you want to put in your pocket. This is one that you want to give to a group of children mm -hmm. to just go out and enjoy and come together to share together. Um, we really wanted to highlight that production value that Troika and Zaza Kids Books have put into it. They've really invested in creating a book that makes the reader want to get inside the poems and gives them the space to think and contemplate, which adds such an extra layer of rich meaning to the words that Zara Wheel has beautifully crafted. She's also really thought about how she's using her poetry in this collection. It takes you through a journey of different forms of haiku, of list poems, of epic poems um, that explain the awe and adventure of natural processes. And it's one of those books that's going to want kids are going to want to find out more after dipping into it. It is a really beautiful collection and I know you talked about the illustration in it. I think the way that they've all kind of ma have married nicely with that with the illustrators that they've worked with just works so well and it does make you want to just pick up the book and like just delve right in doesn't it? And it's, it's a really important thing across the shortlist as well the illustrations were spoken about just as much as the words because in each of these collections the publishers have thought really carefully about who the right illustrator is for the collection and they're not just illustrations that exemplify what's said in the words they take the reader far beyond that and they engage the reader in the words in a completely different way um, and when I was talking about the shadowing scheme before one of the things that we've really tried to get across in the notes that we've written for each collection is the role of the illustrations and lots of the activities that you'll see in the teaching sequences are about getting children to engage in art themselves and looking at how they can make meaning through pictures as well as through words that they're writing um, and that's all in line with the philosophy that we have around our power of pictures research as well. Um, so obviously we've got a wonderful collection of books for the shortlist so it must have been quite a tough decision on the winner how did you kind of come to that decision for the winning title so I, I did say that choosing the shortlist was really easy and really mm. harmonious choosing the winner was not we had a much more <laughs> lengthy discussion uh, around the winner uh, than we did around choosing the actual shortlist 
Um, all of the judges had favourite titles and then it was very harmonious in coming together and talking about which one would best represent what we want from the clipper today. Mm. Um, and we didn't feel uh, like we could pick one winner. So we got we got down mm. to these two together and, and that was a real, real tough decision to get between them. So we decided that we would uh, have we've, we've had one uh, we've had a few in the past highly commended collections where it, it really is you can't let one of them go because it really does deserve a, that little bit more recognition and I think one of the reasons for this was again the beauty of the poetry and the invitation for children to get involved with poetry but we really did want to recognize the value of the translation in this yeah. as well Lawrence has done such a beautiful job in it um, and we came down to it on this one just because we felt that it was a, po a poetry collection that spanned ages. You could have early years children involved in this. You could have just as much from year six, year seven children um, getting poems out of this. And what we wanted was a collection that would really bring children together, particularly in this year, um, to engage in making sense of the world and reflecting yeah. on the world themselves. And, and that's why this one came out. It feels very relevant. Um, so I think that leads us nicely then into talking to our winner, Zara Weil, and the translator of the highly commended book uh, collection as well, Lawrence Schimmel. So we're just going to get them to join us. Guys, um, thank you for joining us on the podcast today. We're really excited to have you both here. Um, we just wanted to have a chat about your Clipper experience and just um, congratulate you both as well on winning... Um, Clipper 2020 and the highly commended. Thank Brilliant. You. Thanks both. Thanks so much to, for joining us. Um, first of all, I want to ask the, the big question. I want to ask you first how the Clipper experience has been for you. How did it feel when you were first told your collections were shortlisted? And then what was it like to find out that you'd won and received a highly commended award? Saro, I'll come to you first as our overall winner. Um, it was like uh, seeing the light I, <laughs> it was, it was just uh, this dazzling light. Uh, it was like a, a, a yellow ball of the sun coming up or the moon getting silver or a comet shooting by. It was completely extraordinary and unexpected. And winning was even more dazzling and, and honestly, much more unexpected. That, so I was just overjoyed and honored and all those other very, very good things in life. I love how even your answers, Zara, are poetic and full of nature. Just <laughs> I like was your just about to say the same thing. <laughs> and Lawrence, Lawrence, for you, this is the first time a work in translation has ever been shortlisted. How did that feel, especially for you as a translator, um, for the collection to go on to be highly commended? For me, it was an amazing experience. It was totally unexpected. I mean, uh, poetry in translation has a lot of um, pushback in general, I think. Uh, people are afraid of poetry in translation, that so much gets lost as opposed to seeing what's lost by not translating poetry, all these voices from around the world that we're not having access to. So it was wonderful that, um, you know, first when we, when we got the news about the shortlist, that was just by itself was so amazing. Um, and especially, you know, I was very pleased for the Emma Press, which has been almost single-handedly changing the face of UK um, children's poetry by publishing poetry and translation for kids from all sorts of languages. So that was really um, amazing. The experience from the clip, from the CLPE has also been fantastic where they've named the translator everywhere, which is one of the things that translators were often, um, there's a lot of media campaigns where translators are often not mentioned in reviews of books or on the, you know, the covers of books or things like that. And so it's been wonderful that I've been included as, you know, Carmelo's English voice, you know, he sends, he's delighted and happy and he's, you know, says, go out there and, you know, you deserve this because you're, you're the one who did it in English, you know? And so um, he doesn't speak any English. So he apologizes for that, but he's so, pleased that his book, uh, which was first published in Spanish 10 years ago, is finding a decade later a new generation of readers. So, I was about to ask actually what Carmelo's thoughts were on, on winning the award. So it's great to know that he's, he's overjoyed by it as well. 
And I think especially great for you to mention the Emma Press, Lawrence, because yeah. they've done such fantastic work in this area. I do implore everybody to go and look at the other collections in translation that are on the Emma Press website. Uh, two of my favourites are Super Guppy uh, at the minute. It's the most joyful collection of younger children's poems that just look at the world from a child's perspective. They're brilliant. And um, The Book of Clouds is another one that really got me that I read last year as well. Um, but please do go and have a look at the Emma Press website because they really are championing poetry and translation and doing an absolutely marvellous job as you said uh, Lawrence. So I mean you could say that the winners oops, that the, I mean you know Zara's book is published by Zaza in conjunction with Troika and both Troika and the Emma Press are really the two small presses in the UK that are so dedicated to children's poetry right now. Some of the bigger presses do publish occasionally um, but these are really the two presses that are diehard poetry for children fans. So if I can you know, add a third one in there, Lawrence, I'd like to put a special mention in for Otterberry books as well, because Jeanette Otterberry, again, small publisher, is doing a, a great job with, with highlighting poetry. Um, as a judging panel, I'm going to say to you both, both of these two collections were so important for us and it took us a long time to deliberate um, over, over the winners and the highly commended. But for us, these two collections were particularly important, not just for the times that we find ourselves in now with the pandemic, but also how we engage and we interact with what the world in the future. I think what's beautifully unique about both of these collections is that they ask the reader to stop and to look and to engage with the world around us. So I wondered, Zaro, what were the inspirations and motivations for you when you came to write and put the Cherry Moon collection together? I think that being close to nature, feeling part of nature, feeling the joy, the mystery, and being completely overwhelmed by natural forces is something that I and that everyone, and that particularly children, are inherently close to. We are children of nature, and there's no other way of putting it. And to be able to give voice to those experiences that we encounter in nature helps us to understand who in the world we are because you're not who you are on your own. We don't live on pedestals. We don't live in isolation. We are who we are only in relation to the world around us. And I think for me, proximity to nature, writing about nature, feeling all those forces of nature is what gives energy to my writing and gives and gives gives it the light hopefully um and you, you tackle some quite difficult subjects in here as well. So obviously you're, you've got the awe and wonder of the world around you, but you've got poems like Elephant Tusks that are a little bit more engaging to the children to actually take notice of nature and their role in doing something about the preservation as well. I think that is the, the ultimate goal um, and the intention of the book is, yes, not just to experience the awe, the wonder, the joy of it all, but to try to understand how we can do something to preserve this heritage that we have as human beings, which is a heritage that demands that we preserve what is around us. And that it's hopefully something that children of this generation can do better than the children of my generation were able to do. And Lawrence, this was Carmelo's first collection for children. What do you know about how he came to putting the collection together and, and how important that stopping, looking, observing is for him? Um, so Carmelo, um, you know, he told me the, the origin story for the collection. And, um, but in many ways, the collections are very um, companionable, if I could say, um, mm. I think. Carmelo does the similar thing that what Zara does with the natural world with the urban environment. And so, um, and that's actually part of the origin story. So Carmelo um, is a very prolific uh, writer for adults. I, I grabbed just a, a few of his adult collections to be able to show these off, um, some of his uh, more selected uh, poems. And um, I've been reading him for years. And uh, it started though that, um, one of the more commercial publishers uh, for children here in Spain did an anthology of poems and included some of his because his way of looking at the world is the same whether it's for adults or for children just the themes in this particular book um, were ones where 
um, he says he doesn't write for children so much as the child he once was. And so he had written a few poems and he thought that these might be more appropriate for a younger reader. And he got in, you know, so the anthology came out in 2008 and he got in touch with the editor at the publishing house, um, who is the one who actually published the collection uh, with a different publishing house that he created, the small, a small press that um, did, uh, that did the book. And, and the editor said, these are wonderful, you have to keep writing them. And so that's sort of how that collection came about. Um, and I think you've, you've struck the nail on the head. There's so much companionship between these two collections. I think one of my most favorite poems in this one is Plastic Bag. It's mm. that, I, I always describe this poem as, as having such a complex simplicity. It's taking such an everyday discarded object and it's putting life, it's imbuing life and it's imbuing beauty into this discarded object in such a way that only a really, really talented poet and a talented translator can also do with that to, to keep that emphasis and to keep that vision into the translated version as well. Um, and I think it, it's, it's that, you, you both, write or Cam Carmelo, you, Zaro, you both write with that child in mind, but not to patronize the child, but from the viewpoint, like you say, it's from the absolute viewpoint of being a child at that time. And like you say, writing for the children within you. Zaro, did you do that as well? Um, oh, yes, <laughs> of course. Um, and I, I'm reminded of something that I really like that Sylvia Plath once wrote about about a poem and she said, um, reading a poem, writing a poem, being engaged with a poem, it's, it's like, oh, it's like a, a little door opens and you see a glance of the world. And that world can be a raindrop, it can be a city, it could be your cousin, it could be anyone. And, and it's the intimacy that we have of looking through that tiny, tiny opening and she said something else that I, I really love and take to heart. She compared a poem to a bit like one of those old fashioned uh, door, um, uh, uh, table weights, paper weights. And if you could imagine a paper weight with a little barn and some cows and a little reindeer and a church and, and then you turn it over and all the snow comes fluttering down, she said, that is exactly what a poem is like. It has the capacity to change how we see things. And for me, that looms large in my mind all the time. In, in a, so, uh, Yeah, and, and that complex simplicity that I was talking about before really is imbued in all of your poems as well. Something like um, This Tiny Bean, which again is one of my favorites <laughs> from this collection. There is so much scientific knowledge under the surface of this one, but you don't lay it out for them. You do that. Let's get them with the awe and wonder of this moment so that they want to ask more and they want to find out more and then they can connect more, like you say, with the world around them and be engaged with the world around them. I think that's what the beauty of both these collections are. It's the complex simplicity that comes in these really carefully crafted poems that are just written with the sheer joy and understanding of what it's like to be a child in the world, to be noticing things for the first time, to be engaging with things and learning about things around you and it's that feeling you don't want children to ever lose. Um, so we've talked a little bit about publishers already and what again I think comes through in both these collections is what a close collaboration they are between the poets, the illustrators and the publishers as well. Um, it seems like just the right people have been put together in both of these collections and of course with you as a translator as well Lawrence. So I'd like to ask you first Lawrence, what was it that you first saw in Carmelo's original Spanish poems and what was it that was most important to you in translating them for a new audience? And also how did you both work with Rhea Chowdhury who illustrated the collection? Um, so as I mentioned, you know, I mean, Carmelo is an, a poet for adults as well. Um, I think in Spain there are very, almost all of the poets who do write for children are primarily adult po po poets for adults who also write for children. There just isn't the um, support publishing wise or in the industry for that. There was, there's only one um, Spanish poet, Gloria Fuertes, who also wrote for adults, but she's really known as a, a children's poet, um, you know, the equivalent of, um, you know, Michael Rosen or, or Brian Moses or someone like that for the UK. So, um, so I've been a fan of, of Carmelo's for a long time following his adult work. Um, you know, you can sort of see behind me, this is actually the, the poetry section, part of the poetry section that you can see. So I, I read a lot of 
uh, from here on is in English and from that on is uh, Spanish. <laughs> An um, impressive display. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the children's poetry is in another part of the, the office. But um, so I've been, you know, since I both do adult and children's, uh, my writing and the translating, it was obvious that when Carmela published a children's book, I went right out and bought it. And um, I just fell in love with it. Plastic Bag is actually one of the ones, that was one of the first ones that I translated as a sample. Um, I just, um, you know, the complex simplicity is a great way of, of discussing it. Translating them was difficult to sort of, um, one, because Spanish syntax is often the inverse of English. And so yeah. I had to not just translate, but recreate um, with the enjambments and, um, and he, he's so spare. So it was so, almost more constant purifying to make it as elegant in the translation as it is in the original, that he's able with so few words to change how you see things. You know, it's almost mm -hmm. like putting a new lens in front of you that makes you see the world differently. And, um, you know, as I said, he, the poems, because they, they just make you stop, you know, he, he has that way of, of stopping and looking at the world around him, um, both for the adult work and the children's work. But these, I just fell in love with them. And I was like, you know, I pitched them to the Emma Press. And I, I, I looked it up, it was April 30th of 2015. So it was five years ago that I first pitched the project to Emma and was like, um, I love this book. I know you don't do poetry in translation, but you know, I think this is something that you would like and it fits, you know, and she thought it did and it took a while before we were able to um, find funding to help support it. In this case, it, it was um, the translation won a pen translates award from English pen, which was a great, um, a great thing. And also it was great that um, pen understood, you know, I mean, that, that program tries to help support publishers to diversify the UK publishing scene. And it was great that English pen saw the value of including works for children um, as worthy of support. And so that was something, just an extra wonderful thing about the whole process. <laughs> and, and Rhea's illustrations kind of join in with that complex simplicity. She's kept to a sparse black and white palette. Um, mm -hmm. how, how did you both think, did you both engage with her along the process or did the illustrations come to you afterwards? How did that work? In this case, it was the editor. It was um, Emma Wright, who was the one who did the art direction with Rhea um, after I had already done the, um, the, the translations and Emma and I had polished them and uh, they were ready. So um, in that case, it's, it's Emma's vision. It's, it's, you know, this edition has different illustrations than the Spanish edition. Yeah. Um, just so um, they're slightly more um, uh, abstract in the Spanish edition, if that makes sense. Um, so it's always interesting how um, sometimes the words and the ideas can be can travel more easily than the art in some cases and sometimes mm -hmm. vice versa. So um, that's always an interesting thing. So, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm really pleased with how um, with how the book came out with Ria's il illustrations. It's a it's a unique book uh, in English um, that is its own thing. Um, so. It absolutely is. And Zaro, your poems are such a perfect conversation with those really striking illustrations of June Lee's song. And you talk about the influence of her work in the acknowledgements of the book. You said that um, her work struck you immediately. So what was it that made you certain that she was the right person to work with on the collection? And how do you think the poems and illustrations work together for the audience? Well, I found, I found that some, some German friends said, oh, you've got to go to the Cambridge Art School stand at the Bologna Book Fair uh, where I was wandering around uh, and so I did and there amongst these wonderful portfolios I saw Jun Lee's song, Jun Lee's song's portfolio and she had moons and suns and the most beautiful color palette and because I had in, in former life uh, been a publisher for a long time myself and was very, very close to the idea of illustration and very, very design conscious. I saw something there that had such spark and such energy and such life that I was immediately attracted to it, a bee, like a bee to honey. And I thought, I, I love this woman. And it turned out that she was there and we met and, um, and I, I gave her a copy of uh, my book, Firecrackers, which had just been published, and she seemed to like it, and that was a good sign. <laughs> and then we, we just talked, and, um, and because Troika is such a, a generous and, and kind a company, 
I said that I, I really wanted to be working hand in hand with Jun Lee because I, 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 I love doing that. And so we did have, as you said, Charlotte, we did have a wonderful conversation that went over a year and we Skyped with each other um, once a week and we shared screens and I could see her, her pen going and she made sketches and, and we, we just um, kept evolving. And she would take some of my poems and put them into an understanding that I didn't even have of them. And one time she did some poems, I think it was for uh, fireflies. And I had put down in the original text under this turquoise sky. And when she did it, she made it all peach. And I thought, oh dear. So no, it's better in peach, perfume peach sky. <laughs> it sounded better and it worked better and it looked better. So we just kept going back and forth because I'm, I'm not too, too precious about my lines and I'm not too precious about my ideas and neither is Jun Lee. So we had lots of doors that we kept open during this whole process. And they really were then that perfect conversation. Her artwork influenced your words just mm -hmm. as much as your words had influenced her artwork. And again, credit to Troika and you guys for the production values on this book. It's absolutely beautifully presented. It's a book that you really want to give as a present. It's a book that, you know, the size of it is lovely as well because it's a book where children can come together and share together. But decisions like this, where you will just give a whole double page spread to an illustration to give, and it really melds with the sense of mindfulness of the book as well that you've just read a poem and then you've just got that space to breathe and to take in at a whole other level who was involved in the decisions like that Zara? Well um, um, all of us really and and because every every page costs money when you're when you're printing a book. and to give a lot of pages no text in a poetry book is a big decision and full color as well and, and full color <laughs> and you know head on and and we all decided and 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 we felt that it was absolutely important and worth it and let's just go for it and so we did and we have many pages that are just giving voice to the feelings that you might have after reading this poem um, one of my one of my things that i like the best and this one really surprised me at the almost the end the last poem is trees and me about going to the woods and having a little chat with the trees. <laughs> you talking to them, and the trees talk back to you. And I had it on a much more, I, I thought of it as a much more ephemeral thing. And then, and then on the next page, Jun Lee had all these little motor cars <laughs> going on. She changed the voice of the poem, which I completely loved. And I thought it was so lighthearted and wonderful that Jun Lee had these little cars and little policemen and little couples traveling around in, inside the roots of trees because that that's what was going on inside the tree underneath the ground so um I think it was a great decision to to have those pages like Charlotte says so I just wondered if you'd both managed to see any of the teaching resources that have been written for the two collections on our Poetry Line website and what you hope that children are going to gain from reading and engaging with your collections in schools and libraries. Zara, shall I come to you first? Well, I was completely blown away by what you, what you did with the teaching notes. Um, it, it's as though, um, you know, somebody had come along with a big, wonderful bag and picked up everything and put it in the bag and completely understood um, what I was trying through very few number of words to say. Um, I, I, I really was inspired by these teaching notes and wish I were back in, this, in the classroom with kids to, to, to follow them. Um, and I was very impressed with, with the way that you were continually asking how to search for a story, how to search for meaning, how to search for rhythm, how to search for line, how to search for visuals, how to search for a message, how to search for you, essentially, because that's what poems are all about. It's a, it's a, it's a big search for you <laughs> and what means something to you and who you are as a result of that. And I think that all the lessons that you painstakingly put together were so articulate and so well presented um, and so well defined that you express things that I, I didn't know I had written even. 
So um, it was it was it was quite epic for me, and um, um, a little bit teary for me to read it all. And I cannot wait and hope that we get some nice results, some shadowing results. It would be an utter joy, more dazzling than any light one could imagine to see these children reading or performing, reading their own poems, performing my poems or Carmelo's poems or any of the other poets. It would just, that, that, that's the payoff. And that's really the takeaway, isn't it? That's what we're all after. Absolutely, that's exactly why we produce those resources. And Lawrence, have you managed to see the ones for Poems the Wind Blew In? I've, I've seen them and I showed them to Carmelo, so even though he couldn't read them, he was also completely flabbergasted. I mean, you know, there's 21 full pages of, of uh, teaching resources. It's almost, I mean, word for word, it's longer than the book. <laughs> and so it was just amazing that, um, yeah, I mean, especially Carmelo's poems are very spare and, um, you know, he, he leaves so much um, you know, there's, you have to take out so much in order to leave room for the wonder to come in. And so, um, and I think that the teaching notes were really great about um, helping kids to be able to find that themselves. And so, um, you know, a lot of the, the teaching notes engage with the poems themselves and looking at the, the very small domestic things in their lives, um, you know, just as poems. It was great that, you know, the, the I think it's the 10th mm -hmm. um, uh, teaching resource is actually about translation and comparing, you know, it was, I was, as a translator, I was fascinated to see that, um, that you guys ran it through uh, Google Translate and then had them compare just a little translation versus the actual polished, uh, purified translation and how that's different. And so it, it really shows um, that the translator the human translator is doing things, making decisions and things like that. Um, I would also say that just as a compliment to the wonderful resources, um, the Stephen Spender Trust, which has a lot of resources as well about poetry and translation for kids, would be a great thing for classrooms to make, avail uh, make use of if they would like to continue to, or to have additional resources um, about translation. And actually, um, students can translate their own poems and present them to the Stephen Spender Prize has a competition specifically for um, teens and I think for under, I, f I forget what the actual age cutoff, but they have, you know, two different competitions for uh, early younger kids and then teens as well as an adult category. So, you know, um, all the shadowing work that they can do, they can maybe even present it to, to the Stephen Spender as well. Absolutely. And um, we worked with the Stephen Spender Trust before, and particularly Sarah Ardizone, who's um, involved with them quite a lot as well. And that was really what we wanted to do with that session in the teaching sequence, is to show that actually your name's not here just because you're running words through a translator. You're having to do as much poetry, actually, as Carmelo is sometimes to actually keep that essence of the poems in there. So we, we thought for the children, it, it's really important to actually engage them with the job that you'd actually be doing and showing them the difference between just merely translating a word and actually translating a poem and what it means to retain that poetic nature so I'm really glad you're pleased with that session um, so at CLPE we obviously run the clipper and the sole purpose of the clipper is to raise the profile and the importance of children's poetry I want to at least finish by asking you both why you think poetry for children is particularly important particularly again Lawrence with what you've said about um, children's poetry in Spain as well and what you think that poetry offers children that other kinds of reading might not Zara should we start with you again that um, poetry offers children a chance to reimagine themselves, reimagine the world, because the poetic structure is so non-everyday. It, it breaks the rules of every day and it goes into a, it, it delves into the misty moonlight non-thoughts that we have, things that we can't quite articulate but rest within all of us, the dreams that we have at night, the thoughts that, 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 that that float slowly and, and quietly it, um, in our minds and in our hands and in our bodies. And I think a poem through the use of wonderful language, through the use of energy, through the use of musicality, through the use of art, creates an outlet for these thoughts and these feelings and these understandings that we have as human beings to come forth. And that's how we come to learn to, as I said earlier, to understand not just the world, but who we are 
in relation to that big unidentifiable world out there. And Lawrence, what for you, what do you think children's poetry offers? Um, you know, I think that children love poetry um, and then they, you know, a lot of people learn to unlike poetry, uh, either because they study it in school in a certain way. You know, I mean, I'm from the US and a lot of times we had to dissect poems rather than appreciate poems. And I think that kills the joy of poetry for a lot of, of kids. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think that, you know, when we're learning even our relationship with language, rhyme is something that's, that happens so early on, you know, when we're, we're having our first uh, phon phonetic, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, you know, and we, we, you know, early rhyming things are ways of, um, as a translator, though, this is something that drives me crazy because, you know, I translate in both directions and in English, you know, cat and bat are really mm -hmm. simple and really easy. But bat, for instance, in Spanish is murciélago. It's, <laughs> it's one of the only words that has all five vowels in it. It's a really long word, you know, but because in English, it's such an early phonetic learning tool um, and it's so easy to rhyme on. I mean, the colors too, black and blue, have lots of rhymes in English and azul and negro have no rhymes in Spanish. And so when I'm translating the other direction, um, especially translating rhyming poetry, that's uh, more difficult. But I mean, one of the things that I really like um, about the, the winners this year and the, the highly commended is, um, you know, I think that the children's poetry, there's a sort of, um, which is great and I write it myself, there's a sort of fun, zany, um, outrageous, uh, sometimes scatological um, rhyming children's poetry, which a lot of people think is the only type of children's poetry without um, and it's not that it doesn't respect kids. Kids love that stuff as well. But I really like that um, the jury chose two books that are quieter in many ways. And, um, and that's equally important because I think that the kids themselves love these poems. You know what I'm saying? And they recognize them. And one of the things that, you know, I hope, especially with Carmelo's book, is that um, they understand that, you know, the subjects for poems can be anything, even if it's trash, you know, and, or things, you know, like the, pl the plastic bag or, you know, um, there's one poem that's very, very, I think it's only four lines where he says that the wind is the fastest reader of newspapers, you know, and just the way of seeing <laughs> the wind blowing the, the newspaper, you know, I mean, it's that there's poetry, you know, we are immersed in poetry all around us and it's just a question of stopping and seeing it rather than, um, you know, that poetry uh, is an abstract, unattainable thing that only certain people can be poets. It makes it very accessible, um, domestic, um, you know, I mean, Zara's poems are very focused on the natural world, Carmelo, he lives in San Sebastián, which is one of the, the Spanish cities on the, the northern coast. And, um, you know, I live in Madrid. Madrid is completely urban and San Sebastián is different because it's on the water and it's facing the water. So the city is, you know, the heart of the city is facing the bay. So in many cases, he has um, very urban stuff, but he also has some natural world as well. You know, he has access to more natural world in his life than I happen to. So. Um, you know, I think he's, he's very, he balances that very well. Um, but I just, you know, I hope that, you know, kids who read the book will, will be able to start seeing um, poetic moments in their own lives everywhere. I think that's such a good place to end on and why we wanted to bring you together today rather than having separate conversations with you because there is that synchronicity. And like you say, um, there is a lot of children's poetry out there, but we must never underestimate what we think children will be interested in. You know, a lot of people, like you say, do think, oh, it has to be rhyming. It has to be funny. We know it doesn't. Kids need to see the poetry that's around and within every single one of them as well. And I think that's what especially these two winning collections are going to be about. It's going to be about children seeing the joy of the world around them, but also being able to see actually I could do that as well I can express my views I can talk about things that I want to talk about in my own words in the same way so although people might see them as complex they're so accessible and they, they're so meaningful to children and I think that's why they, they rose above the others thank you so much both of you for joining us today it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you and an absolute pleasure to hear more about um, the craft of your work both as a translator and as a writer Gracias. thank you thank you everyone great to see you yeah, it was really great to have our guests join us today and obviously all, all as always your insight as well Charlotte um, it's always much appreciated so we want to get children involved in our clipper scheme this year for, um, for, for poetry so can you just tell us a little bit more about the impact that it's had since it began in 2015 Absolutely. So 2015 was the first year that we did the shadowing scheme and we really wanted to bring the shadowing scheme alive because this award is for children. 
So actually, we want to see the impact that the shortlisted collections that we pick have on the children themselves. Does it engage them in reading? Does it engage them in writing poetry? So we set up a shadowing scheme whereby we really uh, focus on schools engaging with those shortlisted collections so they can download the teaching sequences and the videos from Poetry Line and they can spend three weeks really deeply getting into a collection and doing all of those things I mentioned before, listening to poetry, responding to it, performing it and then into writing writing themselves and we've seen such a fantastic impact so to join the shadowing scheme what you need to do is to video an individual a small group or a slightly larger group of children performing one of the poems from any of the shortlisted collections and to send your best entries into us to judge at CLPE and the clipper judging panel will select a winner for each shortlisted collection now this year we're giving those winners some amazing poetry prizes including one overall winner's chance to perform live at next year's poetry uh, event and what that does is really engage children with not just the shortlisted text but the poets who create them but also inspires them to revel in the joy of poetry as readers but be empowered by the poetry that they read to write for themselves We've seen some fantastic winners over the year. Um, I think the first year we did it in 2015 is one of my most memorable performances ever. And you can watch this uh, on Poetry Line is a little boy called Mahir who didn't perform from one of the shortlisted collections, but he wrote his own poem uh, based on a poem called Gingerbread Man from Joseph Coelho's collection. And every time I see this boy, it makes me cry. It is the pure power of poetry. So Gingerbread Man is, is a poem about a child who is we think is being bullied by another child, but it twists and turns and it turns out that he's the bully. Mahir saw something in this poem and he wrote his own poem based on his experiences of racism in school. Um, he talked about children who had picked on him because of the colour of his skin. It was happening at a time uh, where he was being called a terrorist by other children in the class. And poetry in the poem he wrote that was called Racism really was his outlet to get that yeah. experience out, to make sense of it himself, but also to be empowered to say, this isn't right. I've got a voice to say this isn't right and poetry is my medium to do that. We also had a fantastic uh, winner called Quincy when Carl Nova's collection won our 2018 award. He did the most beautiful, musical, rhythmic, physical performance um, of a poem called The Dancer by Carl, where he somersaulted on stage. But every choice he made was to bring meaning to the words yeah. that he saw on the page. And you could really see the connection he made with that poem. Um, and as I said before, we've had some beautiful um, younger children's performances from Michael Rosen's Great Big Cuddle. We had a lovely rhyming poem, Bendy Man, by a large group of reception children who found the utter joy. You can't not find the utter joy in Michael Rosen's poetry, but they found the utter joy in the playfulness of the language and the rhyming patterns. Um, so children of all ages can take part, right from reception up to year seven, year eight, year nine. We've got a yeah. Key Stage 3, Key Stage 4 collection mm -hmm. this year, so we want to see as many entries as we possibly Possibly can. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, to what we receive this year. Um, so we've mentioned the shadowing scheme. Obviously, it's just another reminder that you can get involved. You have until the 20th of November to take part in that. So if you download the teaching notes, which we'll link in the video um, below, you'll be able to um, submit your entries. And it, we can't wait to see what you what you all come up with. Um, we are open as well to videos of the children's own poems as well. So it would be really great to see what they can come up with. It would be lovely to see some of them performing their own poetry. Um, but if you do want to get involved, then make sure you click the link below um, and you can find all the information on our website. Um, make sure you follow us on social media as well. So on Twitter at CLP1, at CLP.org.uk on Instagram. And again, subscribe to the YouTube um, we'll be uploading more and more content um, and as well if you want to access all of our home learning resources you can become a POR member as well so we've got I think is it 12 new resources that have gone up now and um, so we're well over 70 I think resources now for home learning um, and there'll be more coming as the term progresses we'll keep adding to that bank of resources yeah so definitely um, if you want to make sure that you're all prepared for the well, it seems inevitable circumstances at the moment, but who, who knows? I don't want to say that. 
um, of working from home, um, then that's a really great resource to have. Also and again, your... if, if we do get into working from home again, please share the shadowing scheme and the Poetry Line website with your parents as well. The great thing about the shadowing scheme is it doesn't have to be groups of children that are performing. You can have individual performances from children as well. So if you, if you do have children that are off school, that's a brilliant thing to engage parents with. And you can get them to make the videos of children performing from the shortlisted collections at home as well as in school. Definitely. And we have, as always, got lots more, more going on within CLPA as well. So make sure you stay up to date by joining our, our newsletter as well, which you, again, I'll put the link below for you. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. It's been a really good show. <laughs>